I'm Pastor Horace Dowdy, and I'm today in the Grace Episcopal Church in Lexington, Virginia. And today I'm going to do a, another uh, lesson on Robert E. Lee. I've done a series, and this one will focus on his religion. Uh, these stories, these history lessons are all found in volume one and volume two of my books that I have written uh, on local history around Lexington, Virginia. They are available here in Lexington at Downtown Books and the Bookery, and also on Amazon. The Religion of Robert E. Lee. General Lee spent the final years of his life right here in Lexington, Virginia, a stronghold of Presbyterianism. He rests here to this day. However, Lee's beginnings lay east of our mountains in the country of wealthy Tidewater plantations. Most of those planters were members of the established Church of England or the Anglican Church. After the American Revolution, the denomination became the Episcopal Church of America. In contrast to the Scot-Irish dissenters, most of whom were Presbyterian, especially here in this part of the valley. Throughout his life, Lee was an active member of the Episcopal Church, giving generously of his time and his money and his leadership. On his last healthy day of his life, Lee chaired a meeting of the vestry at this Lexington Church. The church treasurer reported a deficit in regard to the pastor's salary. Lee's body was failing by that hour of the evening, but in a voice that was barely audible, he said, I will give the additional sum. It may have been the last complete sentence that he ever spoke. Walking the few steps to his home that evening, which was right across the lawn, Lee collapsed, never to rise again. Death came a few days later. General Lee's son wrote afterward, Father had a practical, everyday religion which supported him all through his life. It enabled him to bear with equanimity every reverse of fortune and to accept good fortune without undue elation. I have found in Lee's personal letters some proof of the accuracy of that assessment. One example is seen in his letter to his wife Mary after the Union forces had confiscated the beautiful Lee home Arlington House. Quote, I fear, dearest Mary, we have not been grateful enough for the happiness there within reach, and our Heavenly Father has found it necessary to deprive us of what he had given. I acknowledge my ingratitude and my unworthiness and submit with resignation to what he thinks proper. We must trust him." Close quote. Instead of blaming God for the misfortune, Lee is clearly saying, Thy will be done. We deserve whatever God lays upon us. When Lee's son Fitzhugh was wounded and then captured, he wrote, Lee wrote to his wife, I have heard with great grief that Fitzhugh has been captured by the enemy. We must bear this additional affliction with a fortitude and resignation and not repine at the will of God. It will eventuate in some good that we know not of now. Troubles multiplied for the Lees as the relentless fury of war swirled around. Fitzhugh's wife, Charlotte, died while her husband lay in a Union prison. And here is what General Lee wrote. It has pleased God, Mary, to take from us one exceedingly dear, and we must accept God's holy will. Charlotte will, I trust, enjoy peace and happiness forever. What a glorious thought that she has joined her own little cherubs and our angel Annie in heaven. Link by link, the strong chains that bind us to earth are broken, and our passage smooth 
to another world. Oh, that we may be at last united in that heaven of rest to join in the everlasting chorus of praise and glory. I grieve for the anguish that her death brings to our dear son and the pain it brings to the bars of his prison. May God in his mercy enable Fitzy to bear the blow so suddenly dealt. While living in Lexington, after the war, Lee determined to visit the grave of daughter Annie during the autumn of 1870. She had died while vacationing in North Carolina, and there she was buried. He wrote to Fitzhugh, quote, I wish to witness her quiet sleep with her dear hands crossed over her breast as in mute prayer, undisturbed by the distance from us, while her pure spirit waits in bliss in the land of the blessed. In the midst of the war, 1863, Jefferson Davis called for a day of prayer and fasting throughout the Confederacy. Lee responded with this order to his own troops. Soldiers, we have sinned against Almighty God, we have forgotten his signal mercies, and have cultivated a vengeful, haughty, and boastful spirit. We have not remembered that the defenders of a just cause should be pure in God's eyes, and that our times are in his hands. We have relied too much on our own arms for the achievement of our independence. God is our refuge and strength. Let us humble ourselves before him. Let us confess our sins, beseech him to give us a higher courage, a purer patriotism, and more determined will, that he will convert the hearts of our enemies that he will hasten the day when war with his sorrows and sufferings shall cease and that he will give us a time and place among the nations of the world. I wish there were some way to know what was in the hearts and the minds of those battle-hardened veterans when they heard those astonishing words from their commanding general. We have to be impressed with Lee's ability to handle catastrophe, the loss of his real estate, the death of his child, the capture of his son, the agony of defeat, all these things were absorbed with no bitterness. When another daughter, Agnes, hovered near death, near after the move to Lexington, Lee never faltered. He sat by her side night and day for a month, holding her hand, quietly soothing her fever, until she did recover. Now, if there is a finer earthly model for Christian living than Robert E. Lee, I don't know who it is. This dignified and self-contained man would never have been attracted by the flashiness of contemporary television evangelists so popular today. He would have been repelled by the demonstrations of the so-called jerks that sees some of the faithful during an emotional religious revival. No doubt, some of them would have characterized Lee's religion as too sober and too stiff. However, it worked for him. Through good times and bad, up to and including the last moment of his life, he enjoyed great hymns. He committed many of them to memory. He was able to quote, from them as well as lengthy passages from the Bible. Our lovely valley here in Virginia has been made richer by the continuing influence of this incomparable Christian gentleman. So has the college he revived and the local churches right here. Thank you God for sending such a man as Robert E. Lee to Little Lexington, Virginia.